Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of the Scratch the Track podcast, presented by the Dude and Grim Show. I am Dude. And I am Grim. And on this fine day, we are going to discuss Blonde on Blonde by Mr. Bob Dylan, Robert Zimmerman. Zimmerman. And before we get started, I just want to give myself and my fellow compadre here, Grim, a pat on the back, because today... Is our 100th episode. Yes. You got a foghorn sound you can put in there or something? Something. Yeah, like I can put the beginning of the overtime sound. Uh, okay, I like it. Cool. Over, yes. Over, it is our 100th over. episode. And actually, it kind of worked out. Cheers to th- that. Yeah, this is also like our one year anniversary. So for those of you who have mm. been here from the beginning, thank you very much. We appreciate all your support and all your viewing time. For those of you who are new... This is the podcast where we pick our favorite albums. We discuss each track, and we discuss the album in its entirety. Isn't that right, Grim? Yes, and hearkening back to the days where one would have the choice between, oh, I don't know, like a vinyl record or a CD, uh, certain situations in life may happen in which one of the tracks may become scratched. And a lot of times you sit there and you think, shit, I like, why couldn't it have been a track that I don't really care about? So in this game, we decide if given that unfortunate circumstance, which track would we reluctantly pick to get scratched? Exactly. And it's not always easy. And no, it isn't. All, everyone, they're like, oh, it's a masterpiece. So when scratch anything, of it's course like they we are. Want, it's not like we want to. It's not like, hey, yeah, oh my gosh, this song sucks. Like, skip it. No, it's it, it's not even like the be- the worst of the best or something. It's just like, dude, it happens. And is there one that maybe you s- skip, you find yourself skipping that you've heard a million times and you're like, yeah, I'm kind of good on that one. Oh, yeah. You know? Don't don't act like there isn't. I mean, that that's just kind of part of it i mean it's part of the game yeah and so of course having said that first and foremost before we go any farther please go ahead and like subscribe and comment below and after you've done that the comments we would love to hear are oh my god your show is amazing i'm so happy i subscribed and liked and this is what i scratched and this is my favorite song we get yeah play the game like the the idea is that that it's a game and and this is this is kind of a unique album uh we've only done a handful of double albums and one of the th- one of kind of like a, a side game, maybe you call it like a side bet or whatever that we would have for oh, some yeah. of these double albums is where we say, what if you had to put it into one? What does your track list look like? So please, um, you know, and you Let can us tell us that we're be. dickheads with this. And, and I get that, but it, it's an interesting exercise. Nonetheless, yeah, you know, especially with a double you, album. I mean, come on. Use that. Use that brain. I know it's a double yeah. album. I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, there's filler songs and this and this and this. Some of them I know. Yeah, the album's amazing. It changed your life. It's a life experience. I yeah. get that. Um, but what if but, you had you know, to? <clears throat> what if you had to? What if you lost one disc? Right. I mean, like, yeah, which one would you pick? Dude. I mean, who knows? Oh, that's that's like your copy of Physical Graffiti. You have one one disc. And, you know, how that happened? We have no idea. But um yeah, don't know somebody, where that. Somebody has the really other one don't know where disc one is, but a- damn asking it, dude. themselves the same thing. All right, well we've uh, <clears throat> kind of jerked around enough here. Let's get into Bob Dylan, Blonde on Blonde. Now I will say, if you are googling or searching uh, Blonde on Blonde on your computer, make sure you're in private mode or not on a work device because some random things might just pop up. Oh, interesting. Now that I didn't yeah. know. Well, think about it. Um, True. So, could be seventh hot, but this album. Seventh. Seventh album. Right by 1966. Or 61. Dude, by 1966. That, that's dude. insane to me. And he <clears throat> had, I mean, obviously, his first set of albums were very popular, but they kind of call this the, the third of the trilogy of uh, bringing it all Highway back home. 61, Highway yeah. 61. And then this. And we did do an episode of Highway 61 uh, uh, last year. And yep. so... Maybe we'll do bringing it all back home next year. Who knows? Who's to say? Yeah. Who's to say? I, I mean, honestly, I, I would say that um, if I could pick, ah, it's tough. I, I, I may replace this one for John Wesley Harding. Really like John Wesley Harding. But 
Um, I, I would say that those three are in, they're pretty tops, man. Pretty tops. Yeah. Great uh, now, records. I, for me personally in that trilogy, I do rank this one third for the songs that I like. I would too. Or, uh, for, for, I, for, I would for too, man. I like. Those, those other a, one, those other two are just so goddamn classic. I mean, they are. And this one's an exceptional album. Uh, it was it, it, now back in the day, you know, this was one of the first I considered double, double albums, albums of, in rock of, music of, of rock music. There, there had been other um, albums that had been doubles. Some, some of it, I think, was more or, or orchestral. Um, I, I forget there was another uh, another artist who was a singer. I want to say she may have had a double album. But as far as mainstream popular music and artists go, uh, I believe this album is kind of considered to be the first double album of a, yeah. a, a major kind of pop artist. So I think that's pretty cool. No, it is. You know, one thing that that I've kind of I guess I hadn't thought of it at the time. Oh, or back when I started listening to either of these respective artists. But you hear about the relationship and about this thing with Bob Dylan and the Beatles and like smoking weed and whatever. And what's and and and, and not only that, but like just like the influence back and forth. I mean, forget about yes. the, the weed shit. It's, it's really like the influence back and forth is what's most important. And so and I don't even know when exactly they met like or when this when this alleged event happened but what i like doing is thinking about bob dylan's albums and when they came out and what were the beatles putting out at the, at at the at, at, concurrently right and it's it's interesting because bob dylan is is an amazing artist and great in a whole different way than the beatles i you know he wasn't pushing the boundaries the way that the Beatles pushed the boundaries, but in the at studio, the same, right? I mean, or even live, really. I mean, that just wasn't oh, his okay. forte. But at the same time, he could do stuff that was more like roots music and blues in a way that the Beatles could could just never imagine. And and that yeah. and that's what I've always found is like this interesting relationship between the two. Same right. with well, the Stones. I, yeah, yeah. Same with the Stones. Definitely. I mean, dude. Well, they couldn't touch the blues the way the Stones could. Couldn't touch it. Mm. No, no. They did a lot of things really, really well. Yeah. Um, it, it, when I think about that relationship, they, you know, the, I, there was at some point, um, and I, I don't know if this was in the Beatles anthology or what it was, but basically they talk about, um, you know, they, they, they got together. And uh, I think they, the, the Beatles sort of, I don't, I don't know. I'd say challenged Dylan in a way of uh, when I say talking about doing more stuff in as a bigger band, doing more stuff um, as a producer, like musically doing more, doing, doing more stuff in the studio. In Dylan's response, his kind of challenge to them, he's like, "Yeah, your music's great, but you don't say anything. Like it's not like it's it's yeah, I love you, blah blah blah, and that's uh, that's that's fun and all, but like, hey, come on, get you know, get yeah. deeper. And and so it's kind of cool when you have artists like that who who can respectfully push each other. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, and it's funny because it just made me think of this album because coming out in 1966, you think of Revolver and just like... I was going to say, is that Revolver, Rubber yeah, Soul, right? Yeah, yeah uh, Revolver. Where, where those two things are, it's, it's just interesting to me. And I feel like this is certainly a, um, a formidable companion but in a different way. It, it's just a different album. Oh, like to Revolver? Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it's an equal but opposite sort of reaction. Sure. Well, there is a song and we'll just maybe, I don't know if you saw Oh, this, yeah. Maybe yeah, just, yeah, I know. We'll, we'll I just, know where you're going. Yeah, okay. We'll discuss that um, sort of a connection to Rubber Soul, a song off Rubber Soul. Mm -hmm. um, so stay tuned. Uh, but, dude, this was... This was a, it seems like a, a different type of album for him as far as maybe the recording process. Kind of, I don't know if I'd say where he had writer's block, but maybe kind of like collaboration creator's block. Because they, they started recording when they were, um, they started recording in New York. 
um, in, in October of 65. And that's kind of when he, I guess, you know, he was what with, although they're called what, the Hawks, but that, that basically yeah, was yeah. The, the, the band. Kind of the, the, the band. Yeah. Um, and they went there and they, they were there and recording and it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't clicking. And they got one song out of those sessions, which is uh, one of us, uh, what is it? One of sooner us or later, one of us must know. Yeah. yeah, sooner or later. And all the other stuff, it just it just wasn't it. And and Dylan kind of said there was a um uh uh it says a critic Robert Shelton. He was like he was like I really down. He was like in ten recording sessions, we didn't get one song. It was you know it was the band, and I didn't know that. I, I you know I I, I didn't want to think that. I think he was just kind of. Hey, this is what it is, and we're gonna do this, and this is my my guys, and I think he just probably at that point needed to sort of go in a different direction, and that's yeah, when sure. uh, you know producer it says producer Bob Johnson suggested that that he and uh, Al Al Cooper and, and go to Rodney Nashville, Roberts, right? Robert Robertson go to Nashville and kind of it's like them three, but then they they work um, yeah. with some of the st- studio musicians there, which. Uh, which he did, and it sounds like that was that was pretty uh, pretty fruitful for them because they kind of crushed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and I think it's interesting that he that he stuck with Robbie Robertson and and Al Cooper because Al Cooper also played keyboard on Highway sixty one. Um, we haven't researched that album, but my gut would tell me that he probably did on bringing it all back home as well. Right. Um. And then he went on to be in Blood, Sweat, and Tears, so he had, like, a career after this. But, I mean, just the work that he did with, I mean, Dylan and probably many others is pretty awesome. Yeah. Man, we should do an episode or side episode sort of on unsung heroes. Like El oh, Cooper, I agree. Like Dick Perry, right? Oh, like dude. Those, Fucking those, Roy Harper. Roy Harper. There's just those musicians yeah. that really, really were, were there for artists. And they, they weren't in the band, but man, if you took them away or took their part away, they would they would definitely be missed. Yeah, I, I made a note of that. That that is a side episode coming up on the Dude and Groom show. Show. Yes. So, dude, good call on that. I, for real. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate yeah. It. Um, well, so it was interesting. The the Nashville sessions. It sounds like there's a little bit of a discrepancy where Al Cooper thinks that they did the Nashville sessions in just like one recording session, whereas Columbia Records and their their recording <laughs> the people logs, paying the bills would seem. Yeah, to. <laughs> I, 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 I would think. Um, I love it. You know, said that they recorded there from uh, February 14th to 17th, and then March 8th to 10th. Um, down in Nashville, and I think That's, the main reason they, they split it up because I think Dylan had some tour dates that that he had to yeah. fit in, in in between there. But I mean, during those dates, and I think it was I want to say, I think it was the second set of dates. Um, I had these numbers in front of me, and of course, I'm, oh yeah, between uh, March 9th and tenth, um, it's uh, I believe it's Dylan's biographer uh, Will Lentz said that. They produced six songs in 13 hours of studio time on those dates. I mean, that's for most bands that that I think that would be very difficult. But if you know about Dylan and how he records, yeah, um, every so much of it is live. It's, it's, it's a group. Yeah, part, it, it's participation. a good. Yeah, he's getting a good take. It's not like, hey, all right, let's put down the guitar part and try that for the next two hours till we get it perfect, and then let's put in this part and this part. It's like, no, we're we're just gonna get it in like one live recording. Now there may be some overdubs here and there with certain things, but for the most part, yeah, they get it just just right there on in, in yeah. live in, in the tape. And I, I like that about it. I, I really do. I think it it adds just a different element, and it's. You know, a lot of times I think uh, with live recordings, there might be the stigma of like, well, the quality of the recording isn't as well. But when you're doing like live recordings, but like in a studio, uh, you're you're getting that quality with still getting that the feeling. And I think that's like a best of both worlds kind of scenario, which when we talked about Highway 61 was not dissimilar to how they kind of worked on and did that record yeah 
Well, when when they got down to Nashville, Dylan actually they they got to the studio. Dylan requested that they took all the partitions uh, out of the studio, not out of the the room, so that, that they could all kind of be in the same room together, you know, recording and whatnot, which is cool. It just creates a a different, and I feel for I mean, for me, if I was a musician and an artist like that, a more collaborative environment. Than, oh yeah, hey, I'm off in this corner and you're in this corner and it's just a d- different experience. Um, yeah, I, I have, I have mixed feelings on, on all this because there's like the nerd part of me that thinks about, well, like how would I best set up the environment to still record the music in, in the highest possible fidelity. Fidelity. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have, yeah. I have ideas, but I'm also not a studio engineer, so you know I'm I'm here talking about this album. So I guess those ideas don't really mean shit at this point. Sure they do. Uh, well, I I thought it was interesting too when they when they came down to Nashville, they actually put a piano in Bob Dylan's room, and him and Al Cooper worked out songs together where Al Cooper just played on the piano and Dylan would just come up with, you know, lyrics and, and whatnot to a bunch of the songs. And then Al Cooper would go to the studio before Dylan got there and kind of teach all the musicians, hey, this is how the song goes. This is what we're going to do. And then Dylan yeah. would come in and they would they would do it together. So, I mean, I feel like if Al Cooper's doing that, he needs much more credit than probably Absolutely. he deserves. For, well, for and this. in these, dude, you go down to a studio in Nashville, like, they're the best fucking hired guns you've ever heard of. I mean, like, you could, <clears throat> you could just call out the changes in a song and be like, it goes like this, this, and this. And they'd probably give you a perfect goddamn take with an amazing solo first run. Yeah, they're like, really, that's it? <clears throat> oh, dude, yeah, they're... I'm they're, sorry. They're just say my name. Love. Yeah, <laughs> they are definitely, definitely another love. Oh, are they? Oh, are they? <laughs> well, Grim, I think we should probably get into this one. It is a double album, but as you you know, as people will know, that double albums back then on vinyl are not the same as maybe double albums today, or you know, as as cassettes. Um, True. Would, you know, would, would 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 come out? This well, one is. Let's... What, 14 songs-ish? Let's, okay, your total run length of the whole thing is 72.57. So when CDs first came out, you still couldn't have got it on a single CD. But Damn. when they released, obviously, 80-minute CDs, which we're pretty familiar with, you right. could have got it on an 80-minute CD. So the question is... Do we scratch this as a true double album and do one from each record or do we say that it could have fit on one CD after X date and scratch one? That is the question. Well, I wasn't prepared to scratch one off each disc, but now that I look at it, I can do that if we need to go there. So, um, Oh, me too. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to scratch one off each disc. Um, sort of an honorable mention scratch, maybe. Um, now, I do want to say, and to the listeners out there, I, I really, one thing we've we've kind of adapted and like to play within this game is like, what if you had to make it one LP? Not one CD, because it could be one CD, theoretically, the whole goddamn thing. Dude, one LP. Dude. 23 ish minutes aside, you know, like that's kind of what you're looking at. Please give us the list because I, I, I could <laughs> easily come up with one. Let me tell you this, Graham. I can easily come up with one as well. And I think we'll get to that kind of towards the end. So, um, why don't we start this, start this off, my friend? What do yeah. you say? Dude, little, this... start off with Rainy Day Women, number 12 and 35. Now, for most people out there, this is the Everybody Must Get Stone song. And I think yes. for most people who are sort of 
casual Dylan fans, you might not know it as this with this title, but it's the Everybody Must Get Stone song. It's the one you'd always hear on 420 or on college campus and everything where there's a bunch of dickheads mm-hmm. smoking weed for the first time. And yeah, like, hey, let's put on this song because it's really cool and it's 420. Awesome. Yeah. I've been doing this for years. I like this song. Um, you know, and I know I, I totally respect your point about it, but for me, um, from like the music perspective, I kind of like this song more as I hear it, as I get older, because they did such an amazing job of making like this coherent yet totally fucking disjointed. <laughs> it is, you know, and it's it's no. like a, it's like akin to the beginning of what's the Larry David show Curb Your Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. It's, it's 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 almost like akin to the music there. Well, it's to me it's just like a fun sort of Mardi Gras party song mm. that kind of you know band in the background. Yeah, and yeah. The. Th- the thing about it is, and, and I, I don't, it's not that I dislike the song or anything. I think I dislike sort of the, the, the how it is in popular culture. Sure, yeah, because um, I, I understand but, that. But but if you look at the song and you look at all the instrumentation, is there a guitar on the song? I don't know if there is. If there is, I can't really hear it. I mean, yeah, uh, you hear you're, you're really. The horns, horns and, and bands, the piano, the harmonica. There's tambourine. There's yeah. a saloon type piano playing in the background. People yeah, you kind of got the hooting and hollering. And yeah, that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah. And, you know what I mean? And the, and that's totally cool. I mean, dude, it, dude, it just sounds like a bunch of people having fun, getting pie eyed, like studio, like right? getting stoned. And and that's one thing I kind of like about it. And there it's are times so where he almost like laughs in it. You know, yeah. and oh, he does. Yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah, he does. Uh, which, which is kind of funny because there is a gosh, there, what's the song? Of, I think it's a song of Highway 61 where they they or maybe it's a, I, I don't know, a previous Dylan song where they start in this, they're like playing and then he kind of cracks up in the middle and it's almost like a false. Oh, start dude, Bob Dylan's again. 115th dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah and they exactly, start over. Right? Yeah, right? For like, sure. It, it, it's cool to, that he yeah. kind of. It can can be playful like that. Well, like and I him, love it because you can like even that. hear the guy in the booth, like the producer in the booth, laugh, and he's like, "Start again, Dylan." <laughs> that's, right. That's that's good. Right. Yeah. So no, I I like it, and I've heard now. I wasn't able to to dig up, you know, without spending, um, you know, like a good forty hour work week on this album. I wasn't Which able. We will to, do someday. Oh, and I can't. I can't wait to. Um, I wasn't able to dig up anything that basically said something uh, different about the content, but I have I've heard before that the content was like everybody must get stoned almost in the way of like like getting getting rocks thrown at them in the biblical sense as opposed to getting high like like no matter what you do, somebody is gonna throw shit at you. And I've, yeah. I've, I've heard it talked about in that way, which in our cancel culture society of today, I can definitely see why this is even more relevant. Oh, man. So relevant. But I don't think people I don't think a lot of people, even when they probably were stoned, looked that deeply into it. But, yes, I 100 percent agree. That, yeah. That, fair. You know. I mean, Dylan, when he's a magician of words and he loves double meanings and things yeah, like that. Yeah, sure. And this is, this is definitely that, all those metaphors and whatnot. Um, well, I think it's time to pledge our time. Yeah. Um, so track number two of side one, uh, pledging our time, or pledging my, sorry, pledging, pledging my time. Pledging my time. My time, not your time, my time. It's sort of like a MPYP, I don't know all this industry jargon. Yeah. Um, but it's, dude, right away. It has just such a like a real blues sound and that harmonica as he does in a lot of his songs mm-hmm. is so right up front. Yeah, it is. And and they, you know, they reference in in talking about the song that it was heavily influenced by the Chicago blues sound and you can really hear that in this song and and honestly, I would say several other ones on the album. Like the guitar is so nasty and almost unhinged 
and the harmonicas really, you know, it's it's like they're all in some room together and there's just a, a series of mics. And I, I don't know, the, the lyrics are right. I mean, it just, again, it, it's like that grittiness that I think few people can really evoke in the right way. Sure. And I, I think one thing for me is, and, and this goes to the recording and the recording process of them being in the same room together. I think creating yeah. that type of at, that, that, that type of atmosphere, it lends itself to me visually as the listener being able to see them down in kind of some small dive bar down in Nashville yes. up on stage. I mean, obviously, if it was Bob Dylan, I'm sure that, you know, it'd be, you know, no, yeah, but that, be, but that's what it would sound like, dome, but right? Yes, yeah. yeah, but that's what yeah. it would sound like, and I, you're right, and I think that's what's so cool about it. I, um, I love that 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 down home sound in some just kind of like small place where you can smell just like the beer on the floor from the yeah, night and before, the smokes right? And, like, yeah, well, yeah, and like, and this goes back, this goes into the tie-in um, from the Monday episode, like with that version of Quinn the Eskimo, uh, where it's like him and the band live at the Isle of Wight Festival. I mean, it's it's so just gritty, and I mean, it's it's a similar sound, I, I guess, is. is what I'm going for. It it, it kind of. It carries that through, and I think that's prevalent in a lot of Dylan's music, especially from this period. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, All right. Track number three, Visions of Johanna. Working title was Freeze Out. Always been one of my favorite songs of his. And it's funny because it says, considered by many critics to be one of Dylan's masterpieces. I I, I, I saw that. I definitely saw that. Yeah, it, it. I mean, it is a great song. I love the, and there's a few songs where the organ is in the background. Um, I it. I imagine that's all Al Cooper. Um, and it, dude, it, it's just it, it's it just adds such a nice touch to it. I will say I in know. this song, I, I do wish wish at points it was a little maybe more predominant because I just love it so much. I know. And 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 I, I think they were just afraid maybe it would take away from Dylan's vocals a little bit, right? You know. Um, oh the bay, yeah. Right, Nick? Yeah. Okay. Well yeah, and and one thing I would say too is with this song, as with a lot of songs on this album and several others, there's like you you can't deny like the other guitarist, like the electric guitarist, just throwing in those riffs. I mean, they're got, they're it, just, and that's got to be Robbie Robertson, right? I I want to, I really want to believe it is yeah. because I well, think Robbie Robertson's awesome, but yeah, and he does throw in these nice nice just little licks here. And oh there. It, yeah, it's, it, it's 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 really cool. He picks the perfect Tasty moments, little um, nuggets. And I feel like so when I was listening it to it today, from a production standpoint, I noticed that those licks in that guitar, which I assume is Robbie Robertson, is predominantly in the left channel. Yep. And 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 yep. and a lot of times the the drums that that are just kind of like are in the right along are in the right channel. I so know. It's, it's, it's well, I know, and that's it. that's something that to me I I think about like with some of the Beatles stuff like. Dude, when you listen to it in headphones, it all oh, makes man. sense. Dude, but if you yeah. were ever to just isolate a speaker and play, Done. you'd be like, oh, what the fuck is it? There's like oh. drums, vocals, and like a bass that sounds like it's farting or just something yeah. weird. You know what I mean? It's like, dude, have you ever been? Uh, there was like a bar I used to be in where sometimes even if they had right and left channels they'd be playing the song but for some reason the right always went to like one side of the bar and the left was always in the other so if you were sitting on one side of the bar you and they play one of those songs you're like uh yeah I'm hearing half the song like where yeah. the hell is everything else it's like listening to it and they're playing along and singing but you can't hear the background harmony yeah yeah sure so you're hollow. like yeah, yeah. oh dude this fucking mandolin and bass part is sick <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's a whole different experience. Yeah. All right, Tr- track number four, which uh, is the the one lone track that 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 made it from the uh, the New York sessions, and that is uh, yeah, one of his notes. 
Sooner well, and so based day. on that, I'm wondering if, if this is. Oh no, because because you said Robertson came down with him to Nashville, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. I think he was so, there for this too, but. Well, yeah, yeah, he would have been with those other guys, but this would have been the last one. Um, I I mean it's it's kind of kind of soulful like not not so much bluesy but like soulful and kind of straight ahead and yeah well again like has great some al cooper in there i'm sure you know with his um you know in the back and also there's some piano playing too but the song it starts off slow but halfway through it kind of builds up tempo and then they bring out the organ and uh, i i just i again i love it and i love his touches that he adds to it but yeah you know, when they were recording this song, you know, Dylan's known for kind of recording late. Like if you read a lot about his recording sessions, yeah. like show up late and everybody's just kind of hanging around and chilling and Dylan's just like doing his thing and working it out and everything. And I think that was very similar to to how this song was recorded. And they talked about how they didn't even actually have a full version of the song until take 15 where they were like, okay, this is everybody. This is what we're doing. This is how we're playing it. And he had his vocals down and everything. And then on take 24 is when they actually nailed it. Yeah. So, (laughs) so, yeah, but that's that's like, you know, in my, uh, well, uh, not to get in a far off tangent, but you know, miles Davis with bitches brew is more of like, he was recording the process. Yeah, now, yeah. D- I think Dylan had an end goal in mind, and it wasn't like, hey, I don't just want to record the process. But he didn't mind, like, hey, all right, well, we're, we're just going to record the rehearsal. We'll record the rehearsal, right? Yeah. 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 yeah no, I get that. it. Do you get yeah. that, Nick? Yeah. So now we're flipping to side two. I want you. Um, one thing I wanted to note is. Mm-hmm. So bad. Talk, yeah. Talking about Bob Dylan's greatest hits. Was this on that first disc with the blue? I think it was. Yes, dude. Because that's that's where I first heard it. And now, I loved it personally. That's me. Oh, okay. Interesting. Maybe you didn't. Fine, maybe you didn't. Um, no, I'm not saying that oh this <laughs> No, was talk on... shit. Do it. You're like, oh, oh no, it shouldn't have been on there. Was it volume one or on volume one and two? Well, okay, so on volume one, it looks like from this album, there was One of Us Must Know Sooner or Later, Just Like a Woman. Wait, what the fuck? What the fuck? I should have wore a Leads We Can Kill It shirt. I didn't. Dude, what time was that? I'm going to put that in there because that was... Uh, I don't know. Mark it. Well, yeah. I th- to me with the I Want You, it, it, is it on the... Because the, the classic... Here's the thing. The the classic greatest hits that I had of Bob Dylan is sort of like the blue disc with the silhouette of him-ish. Is that the one you're you're looking at? Yes, I am. And I'm looking at... Okay, so on this one... You have I Want You and Just Like a Woman. Now. There's some other songs I would have put on. Yes, fucking A, man. Yeah. yeah. Fucking A. Yeah, for the sure. The gentleman has a major dude. credit card. Do you realize who the fuck you're talking <laughs> yeah, to? Fucking A. The gentleman has a major. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to look up volume two now, but in the meantime, let's just kind of. Me too. Yeah, I'll just yeah. I'll carry the episode while you do that. Yeah, okay. please so, do that. Well, when I got that, I, you know, when I got that greatest hits, this is one of the songs that did stick out to me. Now it's kind of funny because it caught my ear, but that was also when I was a very early Dylan fan. Yeah. And yeah now, sure. like looking back on it and everything that I knew that came before that, I don't. For me, that wouldn't quite make the cut because how many nope. songs were on that? How many songs were on that greatest hits? Like twelve or fifteen or something? Uh, ten. Ballpark. 10. 10. I mean, at this point in yeah, his career, sorry. would you say, would you say that no, was dude. his top 10 best song? No. Well, dude, no. And, and, yeah, and there, nothing. Oh, I guess Rainy Day Women 12 and 35 was on here as well, mm-hmm. which I, I would put on here, but I wouldn't put yeah. those other two. Uh, but, dude, there's so much, like, early shit that they're pretty much ignoring to me. Like, they basically don't have anything pre- 
Oh, I guess they got one thing from the freewheeling Bob Dylan and one thing from the times are changing and one from another side of Bob Dylan. Everything else is electric. Highway 61, Mr. Tambourine Man, Subterranean Homesick Blues, Blonde Blues. and Blonde. They did put Positively 4th Street on there, which they should because how the fuck that didn't make it on an album. I don't know. Damn. Because it's an awesome song. I need more Bob Dylan vinyl. Fuck. Dude. Yes. Actually, no. I, I No, actually, right now, I don't need any more. I'm good. <laughs> um, yes. But. But. So, anyways. Th- dude, I, I I do really like this song a lot. Now, you know, let's get away from Greatest Hits for a minute. And um, mm-hmm. uh, not, only, not only do I like it, but Al Cooper. This is his favorite song. When they had their, those sessions... That they were oh, really? you know, at the piano in the hotel room. This was one of Al Cooper's favorite songs that he played for him. And Dylan just kind of messed with them and purposely waited. It was like the last song that they recorded in Nashville because he just knew that Al Cooper really wanted to hear it. Um, Interesting. You know, but it is it, it is a very basic song. I mean, the song, it moves a, a, along really nicely. But I can't say there's musically or instrumentally something overly stands out to me it's it's uh, but but it's just i good. like that little guitar riff that's like blah, 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 blah. i mean they have a really nice little fast fast True. technical guitar riff in there which i like yeah it, and uh, it's just kind of some classic dylan writing in, in yeah. this song. yeah I, yeah, I, yeah I, I think that's what it is um and and i you know who loves you gotta love some good classic dylan writing right i agree so. All right, let's get stuck, my friend. We spent our time. Stuck we got stuck inside on this. of Mobile with the Memphis with Blues. With the Memphis again. Blues again. Now, this made it onto Bob Dylan's Greatest Hits, Volume 2. Just one, one, two. Now, I, I do like this one. Um, and again, I think it's, it's more like from what you said, just because of the classic uh, Dylan writing. I, and I love just kind of the, I guess maybe dichotomy i hope that's the right word of the title where it's like you're stuck inside a mobile like mobile alabama with the memphis memphis Memphis, tennessee blues again i just there's something about that 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 works for me i i love that kind of that opposite play with the words totally no it it, and that's like you said i mean that's classic dylan he plays with words it's just what he does Mm -hmm. he throws them around um mixes them up it's 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 pretty cool but uh, as far it's as like a the long record, song, seven minutes. It is, yeah. No, it is. It is a long song, and and he has those songs too. That that it could have been a th- dude. It could have easily been a three minute song, but yeah, it's like I, they, they just know. they just they just kind of keep it going and like oh whatever. Oh, well, it, it went to seven. So now fine. one thing I'll say about this song that I really love is like how there is a verse in the song that just starts with "Grandpa died last week." <laughs> like that's just a weird way to start a verse. It you is. Know? It's like you like just it. drop. You're, you know, it's yeah, being dr- dropped in. It's like Pulp Fiction. You're just dropped yeah. in the middle of the movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Grandpa <laughs> died last week. Yeah. yeah. Just it's a shit week, man. Shit week. Unless you got a leopard skin pillbox hat. So, which is another uh, great, great song. Um, yeah, and, and playing with words again. Uh, like, what does he say about it? He's like, um, I thought he loved you for your money, but I know what he really loves you for is your leopard skin uh, pillbox. Like, yeah, and yeah. Just, just the same way that a mattress balances on a bottle of wine. I don't know. It's, it's, I, I, a, I love the words. Yeah, there's a bunch of different things. And, and he is one of those musicians that tells a lot of stories and yeah you 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 don't really know uh, it's like hey is this is this autobiographical is this something he dreamt imagined he just kind of played with a little bit um maybe just kind of how he felt but he's talking about you know uh he he asked the doctor if he could see her but the doctor said oh it's bad for your health then he disobeys the doctor's orders and then he found him, you know, with with the doctor, and you're just like, ah, yeah, yeah. okay, I got you, I got you. Uh, there's some. some it's almost some like classic blues lyrics in a way, but not like directly ripping them off, a la Zeppelin. No, no, definitely yeah. not. You know yeah. what I mean? 
Yeah. Especially early. Yeah. yeah but but I, I love um, how nasty the guitars are in that song. They they just scream in a lot he, of the he, songs. They he just finally, scream. It's like Robbie really gets to like rip it up a little bit. Oh, he finally, yeah. He, he kind of like let him off the leash and said, hey, have yeah. at it. And he does yeah. get that nice nice little solo. And, and I think Al oh. Cooper gets to let loose a little bit, too. Yeah. So I, I really like that. Um, all right, closing out side two of disc one, we have Just, just like, a like a Woman. Well, you know, but she does break like a little girl. So, mm-hmm. which yeah. uh, the, now these are, are really um, some intense. really, yeah, yes. like poignant and, and intense lyrics. And um, well, well, I, in some people, and I think he was criticized a little bit for maybe being, uh, you could call it, you could say misogynistic. In some of the things that he said in in the words, I really, the, yeah, the that's kind of what I uh, that's kind of what I read. What I took it as is, um, if you, I, I think maybe either when he wrote it or he wanted to keep that emotion when he wrote it, it was sort of a situation about how he felt about a woman, and he wrote it completely from a, an emotional perspective. Now that's not to say that you know. After the fact, you have time to reflect on it. You you may have different words and viewpoints, um, but that I was just trying to think how people would would think about that because I mean, there's been a lot of songs we just discussed. Yeah, on okay, our, but then then in the, then at that at that same point is fucking Billy Joel's just like a woman to me. Is that misogynistic too? Well, and think about one of the other podcasts that we have coming up. I think after this one, Jay Z's "Girls, Girls, Girls." I mean, there's uh, dude, "Girls, know, Girls, I mean, Girls." Of course, is he's just talking about all the different chicks that he's nailing. But but to me, this is about something more. To use than the that. parlance of our times, yeah. <laughs> to use the parlance of our times, yes. Beaver, yeah. Uh, I ain't in here. <clears throat> But anyways, so there was some criticism of that. Now, I I love back then or now. uh, It it sounded like it was back then. But oh, I do. I do. I do love the song. I do love the the lyrics and the words. And it it is, you know, I, I, you know, from a man's perspective, you know, showing his emotions and feelings to a relationship that he had and how he felt about it. And, you know, if any, hey. You know, he's being truthful. He's being authentic. You can ad- agree or disagree. Whatever. Yeah. So, all right. We got to take this record off and uh, let's go to disc two, side one or side three. Indeed. But indeed. Um, most likely you go your way and I'll go mine. How about that? Um, yeah, I was going to comment on this. One thing I that I liked about it was... Um, they have these riffs in there that are kind of like did little 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 little, and it sounded to me like they were done on flutes, which I thought was like really huh. kind of stereotypical '60s. But I don't see any credits for anyone playing flute. Uh, I guess possibly you could have got an organ tone like that and and done them hmm. on that. But they just had this this real kind of '60s tone, and and I like the I like the guitar in it. It it's kind you know again just kind of nasty and, and moves it along with good riffs. Sure. Well, what more I think do you want? That, yeah, I mean, you know, they kind of talk about, and this is interesting, when you when you read reviews and people talking about um, Dylan's work and Dylan's songs, they talk, they always, they always say, like, the narrator. The narrator. Like, he's telling the story. And what my question is, is like, okay, is he telling the story or is he telling his story? Because, you know, I would always yeah, kind of like to, to, to know that. And I mean, I'm sure it, it could be both where he's taking elements of his life, incorporating it in. Um, but basically is, you know, tired of is like the song is tired of um, someone carrying his, his lover and just like, hey, all right, you, you go your way. I'm, I'm yeah. going to go mine. And, you know, it's probably going to be be the best for the both both of us. But. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like you were saying, and I don't know, I, I doubt this is the the flute sound that you were kind of referring to, but it does have some interesting sounds, and there's a harmonica part, yeah, that almost yeah. almost sounds like it's sort of paired with a trumpet, almost like it's they're yeah they're, play, yeah, yeah. they're played together. No, I dig and, that. Yeah, 
and, and I, I was like, oh, is that is that what that is? Um, but it, but it does create sort of an interesting sound that I was like, yeah. it just made me think think a little harder. So, um, but um, um, temporary Achilles last Achilles, stand, Achilles, no. dude. Yeah, kidding. it's not Achilles. Um, and and I I like the I like in this one um kind of the the twinkling piano and you know getting a little bit of the yep. you know I, I I dig that sound I, I think it's it's well placed and I just I I don't know I really like that line that he comes back to honey why are you so hard it's just a uh, as they say it's a double entendre maybe. Yeah, well, <coughs> well, well, depends on it's who funny. Honey is yeah, exactly. Well, it's funny, yeah, and that raises a bunch of other questions. Um, the the saloon kind of the piano that you talk about that saloon sound. It was funny though, like when I looked it up, that was actually not played by L. Cooper. So Hargis Robbins was mm. a, must have been a studio musician, and it's good because it sounds like L. Cooper stuck mainly to the the, the organ. organ yeah, yeah. which and is I, I think what we found in in at least highway 61 61 yeah and dude i'm just a sucker for the saloon piano dude I, oh, I, just, I know always I, yeah dude always this am. is hard man because i love that atmosphere it's just like man i just feel like i can see myself just sitting there at the bar sipping on some mezcal and you know you got the band playing the saloon and got my six shooter on my hip right yeah yeah Yep, I so, agree. Moving on, track number three, absolutely sweet Marie. Dude, now this to me seems very sixties in the beginning. I just love that, dun, 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 that, that like organ riff. Um, I there's something about this song that I've always liked. I could see how people would well would see it as cheesy, but there's just really yes. something I've really liked about it. Yeah, I it's just funny. can't black you. I know. Well, it's funny. It's funny you bring up that organ sound because it does have that sort of '60s oh, psychedelic. Yeah. Maybe it's, it's like total a, like a Beach Beach Boys kind yes. of cheese sound, right? Yeah, like that really stuck out to me. I was like, I have not. Oh, I should have plugged in the Farfisa because I bet you I could have got a good, good yeah. version well, dude, of it. All right, so you know that Dylan. I mean, I think when we were researching Highway 61. What he got up to like sixty or seventy takes? Do you remember that? Oh, when, something like crazy, crazy yeah. where it was just like so many takes. Guess how many takes this song took? Four. Two, four, four. Wow, yeah. which is pretty good for him, dude. That's pretty. that's that's honestly pretty good for anybody. It is. It's amazing. <laughs> and speaking of four, the next song, fourth time around. Um, this is our our song that was influenced. By the Beatles. Now, the person who who first got me hipped on Bob Dylan, Miss Amy Brooks, um, one of our awesome high school teachers and just an awesome person in general. Oh. Um, I remember her telling me about this, that like this was Bob Dylan. Really? I think she described it as Bob Dylan's answer to Norwegian Wood. Yeah. And, and you can hear it. I mean, you really like the lyrical content is not that dissimilar. No. And there's no. there's something, you know, there isn't the sitar or whatever like the Beatles. But but there's 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 a similarity there in like the feel and the flow. Yeah, it I, I mean, I will say once I did research and that was pointed out. It definitely you can't unhear it. Well, you, you can't unhear it. You yeah. really can't. So yep. I would challenge anyone to first maybe first listen to Norwegian Wood, and then put this song on and be like, okay, I, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Well, the biographer for Dylan, <clears throat> um, Wallens, described it as like Bob Dylan impersonating John Lennon impersonating Bob Dylan. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, it, I know. It. It. Like, I think that's <laughs> great. Yeah, just watching the watcher, you know. <laughs> yeah, but but some of the lyrics and the the thematic content are very very similar. And I know there's even a part where there's a certain vocal rhythm that Dylan uses where I'm like, wow, okay, I know, it's, it's, I know. Ah, oh, it's just right there. It, really, it, yeah, really it, right it there. truly is his answer, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah, if if you don't 
out there, if you don't believe that, well, there's obviously five believers five somewhere, believers. which I dude, I love this song. I to me, when that guitar comes in, it it could have been recorded in like a fucking mechanic garage or so. I mean, it's just so filthy and awesome. Well, the thing that actually stood out to me in this song was the harmonica. Because yeah. the, the the harmonica, it's very different. Um, it has a very different sound than typical Dylan songs where, you know, where he's standing in front of the mic, he's singing, and then he plays a harmonica. And then, it, has yeah. a, it has a very clear, crisp sound to it. This one sounds it's one gritty. a little more distant. And I'm wondering how you, I, I don't know enough about the harmonica, how you would get that sound. Is it, Do people cover Dude. it up or is there a certain thing? Like, how, what, how do they do that? They don't have it easily accessible. Nowadays, they make something uh, called like a harmonica mic. And it's it's like a mic just for blues players I've that you just that. hold up to it. Yeah, because we used it for Gorman when we had him yep. do the harmonica on yep. Walking for President. And you can turn the gain up to where it's gritty and nasty or clean. Okay. But if you wanted that clean sound, you'd be like in a nice studio mic, you know, a little distance away. But like to get that sound, you're you're getting into a mic and turning up the gain and you're right up in there. And I think each sound is is awesome and has its place. Right. Y- you know. No, it definitely does. It was just it was one of those things that really s- stood out because I was like, oh, typically when I hear Dylan. No, it's you're right, though. Nice, I, I didn't clean, think clear, about that crisp sound. So to hear it kind of far off in the distance was just something I had. And as heard. nasty of a blues harmonica as one could. Yeah, dude, that's a good, good, uh, yeah. good find on that one for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, well, now we're going to flip it. And man, we are going to flip it. And this is this song is going to take the whole. It's like his echoes, basically. Right. I mean. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't go that far. Yes no. and yes and no because if you look at any of the sides, I mean, I bet you to look at the side, this probably takes a a, a little more than half of it. Half. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, yeah. Sad lady, lady of the lowlands. So, yeah, it's what eleven over eleven, eleven minutes, and I, a half. I, I believe almost um, almost eleven yeah. and a half. Yeah. 11 and a half, 11 and a half. And it's uh, primarily, I feel like it stays uh, pretty consistent. It's a, uh, I think if I was going to end. Oh, but dude, there's that part in the middle where it like goes, it like goes metal. Oh, maybe I didn't hear that part. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't fucking go metal. It's Bob okay. Dylan. <laughs> yeah. Um, what the fuck well, his version of metal, whatever that is. No, yeah. it's, it's no. It you're uh, right. It stays really consistent. Does not go metal at all. But that well, would be an amazing. Also very take gullible. Yeah, well. <laughs> I know. I just I want to see if I could if I could convincingly enough throw that out there. <laughs> I was like, no. I did listen to the whole. I promise you, I listened to the whole song. For this I know, moment, me too. But, but you're like, dude, at 1123, when it's the same thing for that long, like I could be convinced that I missed something. I get it. Well, there is on oh, what album is it where I think that final song does? It, I think it's probably on Highway 61, right? Desolation Row, dude. Desolation Row. This yeah. is like it's it's kind of his. I know. Desolation Row. Know. Where hey, we're gonna end the song like this, and it's. Um, I mean, that song itself is is you know is, runs through is is Ten, very consistent. Yeah. Um, but dude, I heard kind of when they were recording this, this is one of those sort of late night things and everybody got there and it was like late in the, I think they said 6 PM and Dylan just was in the studio and trying to come up with lyrics and everybody else is like just chilling out, playing cards and napping and whatnot at 4 AM. Yeah. (laughs) Dylan's like, okay. Hey, hey guys, I I I got got it. it. I I got got it. it. Um, and so, yeah. So, but dude, so they, a they lot it. of people consider this like just one of his most classic songs. And and I guess it, uh, people are saying that he he wrote that it was kind of like a, a wedding song for his then wife. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Sarah did. Lowndes. Yep. Who yep. he had married three months before. Now, I. I, I guess I didn't know that. Um, I think that's very sweet. Um, it's it's a very long wedding song. 
It is. Um, but yeah. it is very sweet. Now, I will say, in full support of other artists and the Dude and Groom show, there is an awesome cover of this song done by Richie Havens, whom you might know as the guy who was uh, hand-plucked at the last minute to open the Woodstock Music Festival. And he did a fucking good job, man. He did, too. But he does... He does in, in a lot of ways, Richie Havens has done, like, so many good covers. And, and this is one of them that he did a really good job. And props to my neighbor Mike for... Uh, Mike Walton Thanks. for kind of hipping me to that because I did not I had not heard that version and when you I did I, I it's one of those ones where you're like I think I might like it better than Dylan's Ooh, like yeah. you know what I mean it was that good it happens <clears throat> it happens. it does well there were a few good covers at that festival yeah I wonder how many good covers there were at Kickapoo probably some good ones bro where do you think that yes. dude's doing. <laughs> Holy Christmas. One can Lloyd. only speculate. Lloyd Christmas. All right. <clears throat> well, Graham, Dude, we're here. We're here. We're here in the clear. And we're, uh, we're, man, we might be able to get this one under an hour if we don't, you know, take too long. But time is no object here. That's true. It is Just help, helps towards monetization. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, uh, I think you're up because I just, well, yeah, you're up. You're up. I am. So we've agreed that we're saying. scratching this in our double album format, which is one song out of each disc. Yep. So go. So are are we going to talk about disc one first, both of us, in case we go to OT and then disc two? or? Well, let's scratch disc one and then we'll scratch disc two. I like your style, dude. I always have. Disc one. One of us must know. Wait, let me think about this again. The fans are on the edge of their seat, dude. I want you. No, sorry. Sorry, I fucked up. Fuck I you. want you. Yeah. Fuck you. I want you. Three of you. Oh man, Fuck we could have gone. Could have gone to overtime, man. You started off with one of us must Dude, know I thought about that one, but like I just oh. I do I know. like I, I so I I do like I want you because I feel like it's a little bit you know, this is after Dylan's electric phase and I feel I know, like this it's is a just kind of silly to me. Yeah, I can see that. It's also romantic, man. Hey, dude, I want you. I want it you. is. She's so heavy. It is. Right? <laughs> Oh, Whoa. God, if we could Whoa. get the parentheses out, that would be a fucking awesome song to the same Dude. name. I kind of already know who's going to win it. Light bulb. Right but there. I'd still have it, yeah. Dude, I, I that's, think... Dude, that's light bulbs blowing up like Dirk Diggler, Dirk Diggler's name. Just, it's the, I mean, Dude, the name is so powerful that the... <laughs> cuts glass, right? Yeah. But, yeah. I, I, think, I think we might be able to disregard the parentheses in this case. Just Maybe. Maybe. But there's she's... there's been a couple songs where I've wanted to do songs the same name parentheses almost Ish. like they're they're Ish. that close Ish. yeah. Ish. Well, so obviously I made my I, I made it be known. Uh, one of us must know sooner okay. or later. Okay, which I, I get, I get. I feel like even at four fifty four, which is not what I'd call a long song in the context of this album, because there's some longer ones. Um, I could see that. I certainly could. It just doesn't. Definitely um, not throwing it a WTFITS on that one. Oh, God. I can never remember those initials to do that. But yes, it just doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't do. It just doesn't do. I know. It me. doesn't move enough. You just don't do anything for me. Yeah. I get it. What is it? That boy little bitch, Melissa Robbins. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Disc two. <laughs> Uh, I think. Are you scratching this one first? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I just go ahead and sound the fucking horn because I'm pretty sure we're both scratching <laughs> oh, Sad Eyed Lady in the Light. Oh, so no. let's go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Over. 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 Get that. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Oh. It, it's fine. It's fine. But yeah, it's just. 
here's the thing, especially on vinyl, Grim, and I'm sure you've thought about this because we are vinyl heads, but... I mean, think about you get done with disc one. You're like, oh, that's cool. You put on disc two and you get through you get through the whole side of side one of disc two. And you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to flip it and get to Sad Night Lady of the Lowlands. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, dude. Ah, it, it is a good song. I get it. I listen to it. And I, it's something that I could just kind of get lost in. But. Um, well, thank God it's I at the know. end. I mean, yeah, if, the guitar really doesn't fucking crunch like five believers. I'll tell you no. that. I mean, what if here's the thing, though? What if he would have started this side with that? And then there was a song after it because you're like, man, I got to go through 11 and a half minutes of this to get to that <laughs> song. <laughs> it better be a fucking masterpiece at that point. Yeah. yeah. It better be like, I want you. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, she's uh, so heavy. Dylan's uh, version. Dylan's um, <laughs> all right so here's the thing with this all being said yeah what's your what's your alternate oh um dude all right you want my fucking um uh, most likely you go your way i'll I'll go mine oh okay Um, okay and after you tell me yours i'm gonna give you a little take it's a little hot take my Ruffle some fucking feathers, but I don't care because this is a dude and Grim show and my name is on the fucking title, so I can do what I want. Damn, dude. I yep. fuck. You know what? I'm good. Um Dude and Grim show. <laughs> 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 um, um Cashing out. I, I think point. that's a that's a very <sighs> I have a hard time arguing with your logic. I really do. Um I just Fuck, I'm not going to. I'm not going to, dude. Okay. All right. Well. Yeah, so is that... Else. That's it? No, because, you know, one thing that as we were talking about it, it made me think, like, I can't, dude, I like the honky-tonk piano too much in Temporary Like Achilles. Because that was my other option was Temporary yeah. Like Achilles. I know. But, dude, I just for. I just love, I, I love the feel of it. It's it's like you're kind of sloppy, half drunk, like, <laughs> you know. I've never been there, sorry. Yeah, and really. you're just like, why you got to be like that? Honey, why are you so hard? Why? Um... So hot take here, you know, if I had to make one disc, I could do it easily because I just picked disc one. That's like, to be honest, like when I look at the whole second disc, I like every song on disc one probably better than any song on disc two. Oh, wow. That that's my hot take right there. Well, put Um, that in the fucking comments section. Um, I would. I'm. I'm close to you, but I would. I Swap would. Pull, out, I want you for something else. I would pull out. I want you, and I'd pull out sooner or later. One of us must know, and I would definitely keep fucking obviously five believers, no question. Obvious. And aside from that one, probably absolutely sweet Marie. I like that one. Okay. Right. But well, I'll do it. I'll do it the proper way in the comments section. And you know what? I'll time that shit out just to make sure. I'm not because um, my disc already was made, so I'm good. That's a good <laughs> point. You know that fits on one record. Actually, maybe I will put it in there just for the algorithm, so it adds one more comment. But yeah, <laughs> yeah okay, yeah, fair. Yeah, so I will do that. All right. Well, I think that officially scratches "Blonde on Blonde" by Mr. Robert Zimmerman, Bob Dylan. The third junior, yeah. Amazing. Wow, that was a good one, Grim. And, you know, we kept it to about an hour, which is really good for a double album. I think that's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But, you know, this one, I I feel like this was one you could do it with. You have a fewer amount of songs, but they're longer. And they don't go into, like, a bunch of crazy sections. Like, there isn't that mythical metal section in um, <laughs> Sad Eye <laughs> Lady of the Lowlands that I was talking about. So, with that like, said, it's it's easier to kind of talk about it all. Have? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it's the live of Budokan version. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a hell of a bootleg. 
part of yeah. Bob Dylan's bootleg whatever series. Oh yeah, dude, those. it's it's like the basement basement tapes where you can get takes 15, 17 and 25 of like the same song and you're like, cool. yeah. Uh, man, oh man, dude, I love take 15 of whatever. <laughs> Like, well, okay, it was cool. basically, it was like take 15, but then they forgot that it was in the basement. They left it down there so long, the tape got fucked up and it sounded totally different when they played it back. You know, I mean, it's that's kind of where we're at at some point. That is where we are at. Well, let me tell you where I'm at. I think we're about time to uh, sign off here, Rin, Tin, Tim. What do you say? I Grim? think so. Thanks. So, All right, dude. kids. Thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with us. We have another great episode coming out on Monday and probably another great episode coming out on Wednesday. And every once in a while, we might be throwing, we might sprinkle a few Fridays in there. Who knows? Who knows? And we every know. subsequent Monday, Wednesday, and or Friday episode is probably, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it's, it's probably going to be pretty decent. Yeah. We're not going to like throw in new kids on the block. Just not saying. Yet. Not yet. Not until we get desperate, and that's going to be like 15 yeah. years, 20 years from now. If oh, I'm. yeah, dude. So. That's here. But feel free to like, subscribe, and comment below at any point. Like, you don't have to oh, wait yeah. for that. Just, just pick an episode. Like it. Subscribe. Cool. All right, kids. Take care. Happy hump day. Time to go. The Dude and Grim Show. Scratcher Track is produced by The Dude and Grim. Additional music provided by Moore and the Tims. Copyright 2021. The Dude and Grim Show.